Good morning. Welcome to Grace Church of Harmony. It's nice to see you here today. All right, some announcements. First announcement is not in your bulletin. Every five years, I get a short sabbatical. I will be on sabbatical starting tomorrow. So I will be gone for the next four weeks. Uh, Pastor Nick will be here, and we, except for when he's on the mission trip. Our elders are here. Uh, the church is in good hands. But again, I will be gone for the next four weeks, the next four Sundays. But you can contact the church office if you need anything. Okay, uh, Vacation Bible School registration is, is ongoing now. Maybe think about neighborhood children that you could invite to our Vacation Bible School. Uh, pray about that. Let's pray for, fill this place with children to hear the good news of Jesus. Uh, baby bottle campaign uh, is coming to a close. Time to get your baby bottles filled with coins or checks or whatever you put in there. Bring them back to the church. Western Pennsylvania Bible Conference begins next Sunday evening up at Portersville Presbyterian Church. In fact, we have some brochures about that. They're lying around here in some places around the church. But that will be next Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday night. The speaker will be Kurt Bjorkland from Orchard Hill Church. Usually they don't get someone who's local. This year they did. So anyway, you can check out a brochure for yourself. Okay, and that is all that I have. Pastor Nick. Come, bless the Lord, all you servants of the Lord, who stand by night in the house of the Lord. Lift up your hands to the holy place and bless the Lord. May the Lord bless you from Zion, he who made heaven and earth. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we lift our hands and our voices to you this morning. You made the heavens and the earth. You made us and redeemed us through the work of your Son, Jesus Christ. Hear our prayers and our praise this morning. And we ask these things in your Son, Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. Please stand and sing with us. Eternal weight of glory. But our hope is 
Somebody sent in a question uh, to the church office, which I'm going to respond to uh, in the questions and answers segment of our service that we do once in a while. And the question is, how come when we pray, we sometimes refer to Jesus as our older brother? Maybe you've heard me pray that way, or Pastor Nick pray that way, or hear it come out in a sermon. Why? I mean, it seems kind of a funny way to refer to Jesus as our older brother. Well, let's talk. There's a couple of scriptures we want to look at. Beginning in Romans chapter 8, we'll begin with a very familiar passage of scripture, Romans 8, 28. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. Well, okay, well, how do we know that all things are going to work together for good according to his purpose? Because of what's in verse 29. For those whom he foreknew, he also, that's talking about God the Father, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. Now, okay, but what would be the purpose in us becoming like Jesus? Well, here's the purpose. In order that Jesus might be the firstborn among many brothers. And that Greek word for brothers could be understood as brothers and sisters. So Jesus, one of his, his purpose and all the whole salvation thing is so that Jesus could be our older brother. He wanted a bunch of little brothers and sisters. So he died on the cross for our sins to redeem us so that we could be family. So we could inherit the age to come with our older brother, Jesus. See, he's our firstborn brother, the first in the birth order, and we are being conformed to his image, we're becoming more and more like him as his little brothers and sisters. We're being molded like our older brother. Now, another important scripture in understanding Jesus as our older brother comes from the book of Hebrews chapter 2. We spent some time on this when we were preaching through that passage. That's probably a couple years ago now. But Hebrews chapter 2, the writer says, "'For he who sanctifies,' that's Christ." And those who are sanctified, that's us, have one source. That is Jesus and those of us who are believers, we are all of, we are one. We have a unity. We're united with Jesus Christ. And then the writer says, that is why, because we're one with Christ, that's why he's not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. And then the author quotes a few passages from the Old Testament that he puts into the mouth of Jesus Christ, saying some of this was written by King David a thousand years ago, but actually it's talking about the role of Jesus Christ. And he, I, and he quotes from one of the Psalms, I will tell of your name to my brothers, my brothers and sisters, in the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. And what he's saying you know, maybe David said that, but actually that it reflects the attitude of Jesus. I'll tell of my name to my little brothers and sisters. And then again, behold, I and the children God has given me. Why? So Jesus says, look at all the children that God the Father has given me. The word for children here means something like 
younger siblings. Again, the idea of little brothers and sisters. Jesus looks at you. He looks at me. He looks at all of us and says, Behold, with great joy, his heart bounding with joy, look at my brothers and sisters that my Father has given me. See, and that's really, that's really good news for us. Um, how remarkable that God the Son, who upholds, I mean, He's such power, the Son holds the universe together by His powerful Word, who sits in honor at the Father's right hand, far above all rulers and all angels. He is not ashamed to call you His little brother or sister. He's so glad that you are in the family. And, and you, in turn, you and I can be proud of our older brother Jesus, who is Lord of Lords and King of Kings. Let's pray together. Father, the Bible is your book, and we are your people. Father, you're so perfect, but, but we're not. Father, our ego and our self-interest Our plans, our agendas often get in the way of the truth. So come now in a supernatural way to your people. Speak to our minds and then to our hearts and then to our feet that we might go out and live it. And Father, you know us and we know that, but you love us and in a way that's always surprising. So come now. May we know Jesus is with us May we know that he is standing with us. Father, you really know us. I mean, you really know us. You know our fears. You know the doctor's bills. You know the cancer, our witness. You know, Father, we we want to stand firm in the faith. And you know our hurt. You know the breakup someone's been through. You know the empty seat at the dinner table. You know the fight someone had with their friend. And Father, you know all about our anger and our jealousy, and that even often we get frustrated with you. Father, we have faith. Help us to believe more. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
our scripture reading can be found in Psalm 2. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us burst apart their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage, and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron, and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now therefore, O kings, be wise. Be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear, and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry, and you perish in the way. For his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. Amen. Please stand once again. Our scripture reading can be found in the book of Acts, chapter 4, verses 23 through 37. When they were released, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and the elders had said to them. And when they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, Why did the Gentiles rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hands and your plan had predestined to take place. And now, Lord, Look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness, while you stretch out your hand to heal, and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. 
Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul. And no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. And with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. Thus Joseph, who was also called by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, sold a field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Amen. These early disciples, these early followers of Christ are his people, the, the people of the risen king. And we too, thousands of years later, are people of the risen king. Please stand and sing.
I don't know if you know anything about church history, but, but the growth of Christianity in the first one or 200 years was incredible. The church began with about 500 people, 500 witnesses of the resurrection of Jesus uh, in Jerusalem around A.D. 30, and by 200 A.D., Christians were meeting for worship in every part of the Roman Empire. So you can't help but ask, you know, what was this church like? I mean, you know, it's pretty interesting how they grew. Uh, how did these early Christians live? And we're especially going to be able to answer that question in verses 32 through 37 in Acts chapter 4. But before we get to verse 32, we're going to observe the church at prayer in the face of opposition. So go ahead and open your Bibles, if you would, to Acts chapter 4. And we'll begin in verse 23. When Peter and John were released, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and the elders had said to them. So remember, Peter and John had spent the night in jail because after healing a lame man, they had been preaching Jesus as resurrected from the dead and as the only way to God, the only way of salvation. And that kind of went over like a lead balloon with the Sadducees, the, 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 the religious political party that controlled the temple. And, and they got all the, the leaders of the country together, called the Sanhedrin. That was the high priest of Israel, plus 70 other guys, most of whom were Sadducees. And they told Peter and John to quit talking about Jesus. And the apostles replied to that, that they could not stop talking about what they had seen and heard. They said, look, we're witnesses. We've seen Jesus raised from the dead. We certainly cannot stop talking about him. And they're going to keep on proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ, that there is forgiveness because of his shed blood. And as soon as they were released, they got together with some of the other Christians, and they told them about what had happened. And what has become apparent is that from now on, the apostles' gospel ministry is going to be conducted under the threat of punishment. They're, they're always... You never know when and where persecution will break out from now on. There will be opposition. And some of them, they're realizing, could be killed, like Jesus was killed. And of course, looking back now from our perspective today, we know almost all the disciples, all the apostles, eventually were put to death because of their faith in Jesus and their ministry. Now, the question for us is, well, what is... What's their response to this new reality? All of a sudden they realize, you know, they're not going to be in favor with everybody anymore. You know, what should they do about it? Well, you know what they do is they get together and they pray. Verse 24, and when they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them. Now, we'll pause there. They, they do what you see in prayers throughout the whole Bible. They begin their prayer by praising God for His divine power in creating the universe. If you go through the prayers in Scripture, you will see this over and over again. There is no one, no one as powerful as their God. So they're under threat from people. They don't know what might happen to them, so they go to the one who's more powerful than anybody else, and they call Him Sovereign Lord. You could translate that master of all. God is all-powerful, and God is actually directing everything that is happening to them, even the hard things, even, even the bad things. God is sovereign over everything that happens, and everything fits in with his purpose, even the things that we don't particularly care for. So they're, they're praying to him as that God who's in charge. And they go on and say, who, through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit. So they're, they're going to quote Scripture back to God. God loves it whenever you remind him of what he's already said. He just loves that because then it's a two-way conversation. Now, note here what they say about Psalm, Psalm 2. They say, God the Father spoke through the mouth of David by means of the Holy Spirit. See, that is what the Bible is. It is 
written by human beings with their own personalities, but God superintended every single thing they wrote down so that when we read the Bible, yeah, we're reading the words written by human beings, but it's also the Word of God Himself, reflecting the very thoughts of God Himself. So, as they're praying here, they're saying, God, remember what you said uh, through what David wrote in Psalm 2. And they go on, and they quote from that psalm that we read a few minutes ago. Why did the Gentiles rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. Now, that means against his Christ, against his Messiah. And then they, they continue in their prayer, say, For truly in the city, Jerusalem, there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel. So they allude to Psalm 2, which describes foreign nations, kings, rulers opposing God, and even being opposed to Christ. But they take Psalm 2 and they apply it to those who murdered Jesus. King Herod, Pontius Pilate, the Gentiles, and this is shocking, even the peoples of Israel. Most Jews would have thought the problem with our world is those stinky, smelly Gentiles. They're the problem, but because we're Jewish, we're fine. But, but here, the apostles, as they pray, you know, they, they say even the peoples of Israel, like the Sanhedrin, they killed Jesus. You see, all of us, in a sense, killed Jesus. He was pinned to the cross because he went there with our sins so that we could be forgiven. Now let's continue with their prayer in verse 28. To do whatever, now listen to what he said, to do you know, what, what all these bad guys did, whatever your hand, talking to God, and your plan had predestined to take place. So they're, here they're acknowledging that even the threats of the Sanhedrin you know, and, and are happening according to God's glorious plan. You know, uh, they, they've been put in jail, but they say, God, even us being put in jail, it was your plan. This is all fitting together as the gospel is spreading throughout the whole world. So people, even one day people in Zillianople, Pennsylvania, will believe in Jesus and be saved. It's all part of your plan. See, what you see clearly in this verse I mean, he even uses the word predestined. Nothing happens except what God has predetermined or predestined to happen. Now, the apostles, as they're praying, they're scared. You know they're scared. They're anxious. There are people who would probably prefer them to be dead, and they have the power to make that happen. You know, the leadership of Israel, they've got some real power. And, and, as, and these guys are just... You know, these fishermen from Galilee are considered nobodies, but remember who they're talking to. God, the creator of the heavens and the earth. They're, they're, they're pulling rank, and they're going above the Sanhedrin, above the Roman leaders, and they're going right to God himself. So as they pray, they talk to God about what he has said in his word about himself. He is the sovereign, omnipotent Lord of all. And as I said, God loves it when we quote Scripture to him. See, these early Christians, they have a relationship with God, and a true relationship is always two-way, not just one way. It's two-way. People have said that true prayer is answering God. We talk about God answering prayer, and he certainly does, but prayer really is about us as human beings responding to God. Now, think about how you learned to talk. You, you, you grew up in a home where grown-ups talked to you, and, and they, they would say things to you. And then after a while, you said goo-goo, and then you said gaga. And then eventually, you had a breakthrough. You said dada or mama, and you, and you just prattled back what you were hearing. Really, even as a little baby, you were experimenting with all these sounds you were hearing, and that's how you learned to talk. That's how every single human being and every single culture everywhere in the world learns how to talk. They just 
They, they make sounds, and, and different cultures have very different kinds of sounds from different parts of the throat, different parts of the mouth, different use of the lips. But everybody learns by responding to what they're hearing. And if, if nobody had ever spoken to you first, you would have grown up babbling and drooling, and that would be it. Sometimes you hear these crazy stories about people that were raised by wolves or something like that. I find a very hard time believing that's true. But you know, if, if you were raised by a non-human, you just would make grunting noises, right? Because you only learn to talk as if someone first speaks to you. And, and then you start to make sounds in response. It's the same with prayer. See, prayer, God has spoken to us in the Bible. And as we respond to him, to what he said to us, you know, we grow in our relationship with God. We, we learn to talk to him about more and more different things. Responding to situations in our lives, you know, in different ways as we let the Bible mold the way we think, the way we approach struggles, uh, issues in life. And you see, we, we, he talks to us in the Bible, we talk back to him. You see what they're doing here. They're saying, God, you've said you're all-powerful creator of the universe. God, you, know, you said through David that leaders would, would be, uh, come together to fight against your Christ. So they're, they're just, it's all back and forth. It's, it's two-way. And so that's what it means to have a relationship with God. Now, when you look at verses 27 and 28, it's kind of like they're praying, Oh Lord, what a horrible thing it was for Jesus to be killed. But we recognize that if Jesus had not been killed, we would not know you. We would not be forgiven of our sins. And since you are the sovereign ruler, wisely orchestrating everything according to your plan, if bad things are going to happen to us, if bad things are going to happen to us, help us remember who you actually are and help us not to be afraid of the future. See, notice their prayer is completely focused on God. Now, let's go on. Let's see what else they pray about. And if you look at verses 29 and 30, they say, And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. So what do they pray for? They don't pray for all the bad circumstances to go away, but they pray for courage to keep on proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then they pray that God will continue to authenticate their message through miracles. Now, by the way, you know, there's nothing wrong with praying about, you know, our personal needs. I mean, Jesus himself taught us to pray Uh, Give us this day our daily bread. It's fine to pray about our daily needs. However, for us Christians, our primary goal, the reason why God has left us here in this fallen world is not primarily to have an easy, carefree, comfortable life. And look, look, I'm no masochist. I am not saying, oh, I love to suffer. I, I love it when things go wrong. I love pain. No, nobody says that. And we can call out to God to help us through things that are painful. But the fact is, we are here in a fallen world where people are opposed to the gospel of Jesus Christ, where people do not always care for our message. And in some parts of the world, you go to jail for being a Christian. But we are here because we carry the gospel. We are are ambassadors for the Lord Jesus, the only, the only way of salvation. So... You know, we pray for God to enable us to stay the course. You know, one mark of being a born-again Christian is a willingness to patiently endure suffering. You remember, we saw that a lot when we went through the book of Hebrews, where the author keeps calling for his readers to have patient endurance, to hang in there. Uh, sometimes you will meet someone and they'll say something like, well, you know, I used to be a Christian. Yeah, you know, I, I used to go to church. I used to read the Bible. I became a Christian. Then all these awful things started to happen in my life. And so I just said, forget it. I mean, if that's what this is about, I'm not doing it anymore. And then and they, they walked away. But see, I think we would have to say that we would have doubts 
that that person was really ever a believer in the first place. They were just sort of a, a customer. They were doing some window shopping, but they didn't really come to faith. A true Christian, indwelt by the Spirit of Christ, will over the long haul continue in faith. He or she will persevere, although it will be spastically at times. It'll be imperfectly. They may take a couple steps forward and a couple steps back. They may fall down at times. It may not be the prettiest quarter mile you ever saw somebody run. But over the long haul, they will somehow, by the grace of God, by the grace of the Holy Spirit living in them, they will patiently endure. And I think you see a really interesting example of this in the book of Job. The book of Job, I find it very moving. It begins with Satan taunting God. Satan goes up and he talks to God in heaven and and he says, you know, you think Job is such a great guy. The only reason he serves you is because you give him so much stuff. You treat him so nicely. You've given him money and a nice family and his health. You take those things away from him, and he's going to curse you to your face. So there's kind of this, this, this wager, uh, you know, like, like uh, the devil throws down the gauntlet, says, God, what are you going to do about this? So the Lord allows terrible suffering to come into Job's life. I mean, it, it, it is terrible. Uh, he just loses his family. He loses his money. He loses his health. For a while, his wife walks away from him. But what results, what this all results in, is a lover's quarrel between Job and God. For 30 30 chapters, Job goes on and on, and he gripes, and he kicks, and he screams. It's like he throws rocks at God's door. He says, God, you're not fair. Where are you when I needed you? Why don't you pay attention? Why don't you give me a chance to talk about what's going on? And he complains. But listen, he's not like the Israelites in the wilderness who say, forget you, Moses. We want to elect leaders and, and go back to Egypt. No, it's not like that. He never leaves God. He never walks away from God, but he just, he kicks and he screams and he's upset and he wants answers and he's not getting any answers. And in the end, after he does that for 30 chapters, then God shows up and he looks at Job and he says, who is this guy who's running his mouth without knowledge? Who is this guy? And then God spends four chapters putting Job in his place. And you look at it and you say, now that's a weird friendship. (laughs) That that is a weird relationship. But actually, it's all a lover's quarrel. Because uh, Job perseveres. Not very pretty, but he perseveres. And, And he won't leave God. And God holds on to him. And through all his suffering, and it is really bad suffering, uh, Job never stops talking about God or longing for God. And he persevered, though, again, throwing rocks at God's windows, but he perseveres. He continued trusting in God. And through his suffering, he actually grows closer to God than he's ever been before. And in this back and forth between he and God, he actually matures. He understands God's even more. His faith becomes even more rich than it was before. He's, and his prayer life is strengthened. He perseveres, and in the end, you'll notice how the book of Job ends, God blesses him double. The emphasis is not on the fact that he has more kids and and money again, but the point is, he is right with God. God has given him faith, and he has persevered. Now, look what God does in response to the apostles' prayer uh, in verse 31, back in our text. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued, even though they'd been threatened, they continued to speak the word of God with boldness. So Luke, in his gospel, tells us that just before Jesus was arrested, remember he told his disciples, please pray with me so that they would not enter into temptation. But do you remember what the disciples did? They fell asleep. They just, they, they, in, the, in the time of their friend's greatest need, they just conked out and quit praying. Then, then they gave in to fear, and, 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 and they, during the trial, they ran away, and they hid. Now, here we are in the book of Acts, volume 2, and Luke is still the writer, 
And here in Acts, Luke tells us that Jesus' followers again encounter opposition. But this time, they don't run away and hide, but they actually stick around and they pray. And God grants them power to overcome their fear or to to be bold in spite of their fear. I don't know if their scaredness ever completely went away, but they did the right thing anyhow. Uh, And they continue proclaiming Jesus as Lord and Savior. No other name under heaven by which a person may be saved. And in the Gospel of Luke, remember, Peter denies Jesus. In Acts, Peter is bold before the Sanhedrin. I mean, you can't help but notice the contrast. And I believe that Luke wants you and I to see the change that's been brought about by the Holy Spirit of God. And it says they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit does some really interesting things in the New Testament. Listen to what Jesus said in John chapter 16. Jesus said, when the Spirit of truth comes, He will guide you into all the truth. And then He said, the Holy Spirit will glorify Me, for He will take what is Mine and declare it to you. Do you ever see a, have you ever seen a statue of a famous person at night, and it's all lit up with floodlights? And you ever see, and there's this floodlight, and there in the middle, of the, 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 it's dark all around, but there's this, this big statue all lit up. What do you say when you see that? Man, those are great floodlights. <laughs> Those are the prettiest lights I ever seen. No, you say, look at that statue. It's beautiful. See, the ministry of the Holy Spirit is not to move us to say, wow, the Holy Spirit is on me, but the work of the Holy Spirit is to put a floodlight on the Lord Jesus, to make Jesus beautiful to you, beautiful to one another. The Holy Spirit's always highlighting the work and the ministry and the person of of Jesus. And the Holy Spirit is able to enable you to keep on serving God even when you experience opposition or even full-fledged persecution. Now note it says the place in which they were gathered together was shaken. See, in the Bible, an earthquake is a mark of God's presence. You think of Mount Sinai when Moses got the Ten Commandments and, and there was this big earthquake. See, the image of an earthquake shows us something, that something bigger and stronger is coming in contact with something smaller and weaker. And the smaller, weaker thing can't handle the bigger thing coming down on it. Uh, If you were to, say, after it got cold a couple days, you would try to walk across the Conoquinesing Creek. Well, after a couple days, you know what's going to happen? You're going to step on that ice, it's going to crack, and there's going to be an ice quake. You're going to fall into the water because your substance, your, your body would be too heavy for the ice that wasn't thick enough yet. See, the, the, the reason the place where they were praying was shaken is that God has come down in such power and glory that nothing on earth is able to bear it because it's God Almighty himself. And the result is is that they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and became fearless and bold in proclaiming the gospel. Now, I want you to notice something here. The place was shaken, but they weren't. <laughs> they were not shaken to have a concussion. They, 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 they survived the shaking. Uh, they became, in a sense, unshakable. Now, we wonder, well, how can that be? How can they survive the shaking? You know, when, when God came down to Mount Sinai, People just ran and hid. They were so terrified. How could God's presence descend on the disciples and not shake them to death? Well, the answer is found in Matthew's gospel. You don't have to turn there, but listen. In Matthew's 27, 28, there's two earthquakes that are reported. Uh, And when Jesus dies, there's an earthquake. Now, why would that be? Well, the fierce justice of God The the punishment for our sins came down on Jesus. All the punishment that we deserved came down on Jesus. And and you could say on the cross, he was shaken to death for our sins. But on Easter morning, there was another earthquake that occurred at the stone in Jesus' tomb being rolled away. 
a second earthquake, because death itself was being overcome. Death itself was cracking. C.S. Lewis calls it the, in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, he calls it the deeper magic. See, the gospel of Jesus proclaims Jesus was shaken to pieces so that you could become unshakable in the presence of God. Jesus got what you deserve so that you can know his love. Now you're accepted in him. That means you are now, in a sense, unshakable. Jesus guarantees your future with the triune God forever and ever. And even though you are not going to understand a lot of the suffering that you will go through in this life, you can still face the future with confidence because Jesus was shaken on the cross in your place. Now, in the next few verses, we're going to see what took place as the result of God's message of forgiveness. If you go to verse 32, we see how this affected the early Christians. Now, the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. So their sense of unity in Christ affected every area of their life. Though It says those who believed were of one heart and soul. See, all Christians, all believers are indwelt by the Holy Spirit, and we share in this essential, this harmony, this unity. We share in this oneness with Christ. You know, if you had a hundred pianos, and you tried to tune them all with one another, you wouldn't get very far. But if somebody um, has, has a tuning fork, and they, they can play a note, and if all those hundred pianos are in tune with that one note outside of them, then they actually can play together. And that's what Christian unity is all about. It's not about us just trying to, you know, think alike or be alike or, or have the same views on things. It's about believing and trusting in Jesus Christ, because he's like the, the tuning fork, and we are tune ourselves to him, and that produces a real unity. Now listen, we're all fallen. We don't always do that very well, but the key to unity is Jesus. You know, sometimes we act out of our old Adam, but when we act out of our, our new self, born again, uh, it brings about a oneness in Jesus Christ in the way we live. Now, one way this unity played out with these early Christians is that they did not regard their personal possessions as private possessions. They treat their stuff as common property. And now, you, you, can't, you can't force people to do this. This is not some kind of a political thing. It, it can only happen from the joy of the gospel. These people were just overflowing with joy, and they wanted to meet the needs of their brothers and sisters. Uh, see, we receive God's love in Christ vertically, comes down to us, and then horizontally we show love to other people. Verse 33, and with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and it says, great grace was upon them all. Great grace. God's favor was poured out on the undeserving, and these apostles knew they were undeserving. Look how they had abandoned Christ, but now they'd received God's grace, so now they're dishing it out to other people. And the truth is, we are all forgiven by grace, declared holy and righteous by grace, given a new identity by God's grace, and we're nurtured by, his God, by God's grace. And the reason we get to be witnesses for Jesus in this world, that too is all by God's favor to the undeserving. And, and who were more undeserving than the apostles who abandoned Jesus during his time of need? See, all of us are undeserving because... According to Peter, right, we nailed Jesus to the cross by our sins. Yet God pours out his great gift of grace upon all of us. You know what a great church looks like? A great church is one that emphasizes and rejoices in the grace of God granted to unworthy sinners. That's what is truly great. Now notice how the disciples were given great power to testify 
about Christ's resurrection of which they were eyewitnesses. I mean, you know, they're never going to forget what they, were, what they saw with their own eyes. And this is an answer to their prayer back in verses 29 to 31. If Jesus, I mean, this is their thinking. This is still our thinking today. If Jesus has been raised from the dead, then everything he taught is true. And if he's been raised from the dead, he can and he will forgive your sins, no matter how embarrassing, no matter how long you've struggled with them, whether you committed them before you became a Christian or after you became a Christian, if the resurrection is true, that means your sins are all forgiven. And if Jesus has been raised from the dead, he can and he will create a new world where justice and goodness are the way of life and sickness and death are banished forever and ever. Now let's go a little bit further into verse 34 and 35. It says, There was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. Now, that doesn't mean people were selling their homes and becoming homeless and, and were living on the streets. It means they were selling extra houses or, or, or extra property in order to support poor and suffering Christians. Maybe sometimes there were famines that would come. Uh, maybe people were already starting to lose their jobs because they were identifying with Christ. Some of them maybe are starting to be kicked out of their homes. And I believe what is happening is that these Christians are so convinced that they have been adopted into God's family and they are well-loved, well-cared-for children of the King that they've become super generous. It's not a requirement. It's not something somebody you know, yelled at them to do, but they just want to help one another, especially those who are suffering. You know, Pastor Kent Hughes tells a story about a married couple that he knew. And he writes this, A married couple I know had an ongoing interest in a single mother who was not able to pay her bills. And they took her aside and they told her they wanted to be her burden bearers and asked her for all of her bills. And my friends are not wealthy, but they wrote out a check for each of that lady's bills. And he says, this is aggressive care in the name of Jesus. See, what we receive vertically makes us generous horizontally. And we're given an example here of one guy in particular who was a very generous Christian who was affected by the gospel in verses 36 and 37. Thus Joseph, who was also called by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, sold a field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. So we're introduced to Barnabas, and he's going to become a very important character as we go on further into the book of Acts as a missionary and a preacher. And, and he was such a gracious man that they, they, his name was Joseph, but they called him Barnabas, son of encouragement. And here we see him being generous to Christians who are in need. And later we'll see him pick up John Mark. Remember Mark who wrote the Gospel of Mark as a young man? Uh, the Apostle Paul said, I don't want to travel with him on missionary trips anymore because he deserted us in the last one. But Barnabas was the one that said, look, he's a young guy, give him a chance. And Barnabas is the one that picked him off the ground and kept him in the ministry. And, and then Mark went on to be a, a faithful servant of Jesus, even writing one of the Gospels. He was, it, was, it was Barnabas who picked him up when he was, when he was down. See, Barnabas has received God's love in Christ. Now he shares that love horizontally. He's not doing that to get God to like him or to get God to bless him. He's doing it because he's already loved and already blessed in Christ. And you too, in Christ, are already loved and you're already blessed and seated with Christ in the heavenly places. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that your Holy Spirit has given us this beautiful image of your church that we read about in these verses. Father, we long to be people who have great unity and great grace, and and, and, and and your power works in our lives, and we have great care for others, and, and a wonderful outreach to those who are lost. Father, work in our lives 
to accomplish this. And we, we pray, Father, for, we thank you for the women's sharing on Tuesday evenings and, and, and getting to hear, the women get to hear one another's stories. They're so powerful because they're all descriptions of what you have done in people's lives. Thank you for that. Thank you that Alice Short is coming home today. And we pray you'll keep on healing her. Thank you that Krista Parrott, our missionary, has now been taken, moved from the hospital to a, an outpatient status. Now please completely heal her of the leukemia and, and, and all that's going, all the illness in her, all the chemicals in her body that are out of whack. Please put it all back together. We thank you, Father, for the infant church in the country of Somalia that's growing and growing even though there's horrible tribulation and persecution. Father, keep building them up in the faith. Thank you for the men of our congregation. Thank you for our dads. Thank you, Father, most of all, that you are our heavenly Father from whom all other fathers get their name. Father, we pray uh, again in Somalia for protection as well as discipleship and fellowship opportunities for the roughly 4,000 Christians in Somalia. We pray for our children's singing group uh, that meets at the beginning or between Sundays after church and before Sunday school. Thank you for their willingness to sing and those who teach them. Father, you know we got people with health needs. Keep healing Nancy after her heart attack. We pray for Carolyn, uh, who has been moved over to Concordia St. Joseph's in Baden. We pray you'll heal her. We keep healing Jackson and give uh, grace to his parents. We pray for uh, Larry and, and Kathy for healing for them. We pray for our mission trip coming up uh, in just a, a couple of weeks here, more like one week as they go down to Florida. We pray they'd be able to bring the grace of God to the church down there in Florida and receive God's grace through your people, Father. We pray for the Western Pennsylvania Bible Conference for good teaching that will change us. And Father, we keep on asking you to work in the ministry of Phil and Linda as they minister to Ukrainian refugees living in Romania at the time. And, and we pray that they be able to get back into the Ukraine and be able to teach at the school where they were originally headed for in the first place. And we pray for Doug and Sharon. Uh, we think of Sharon and her radiation wounds. We pray for healing for her and for their work with missionary aviation. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand for the benediction. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace.